<laughs> Hi there, this is Jill Tiny with my very special guest, Sangeeta Patel, and this is the Journey of Possibility. Uh, it's brilliant to be here today, Sangeeta. You are one of our newest members, but you are doing one of the most adventurous things. It's fantastic because you're based up in Liverpool. So a lot of people will have heard about you, but won't mm. know anything about you. So a lot of our collaborators are quite interested in who's this person that's up there in Liverpool launching a whole big collaboration community. So that's partly the reason for this podcast, to find out more about you, more about what makes you tick, more about what gets you angry, um, and predominantly why you're doing this up in Liverpool, the home of community. Um, so. Tell us a little bit, um, what, what got you going in the Bee Collaboration community? What attracted you in the first place? Well, I've known Erkan for, gosh, about 20 years now. Wow, didn't you before? That's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he has been talking to me about it via email, posts, Facebook, etc. Mm. And I went along to a meeting, I think about a year and a half ago now. Yeah. And um, I went along with my husband, who's quite cynical about everything. And at the end of it, he was like, it sounds really good. And I said, yeah. Um, and Erkan and I have similar outlooks in life. Um, so I was like, this sounds really good, um, but I'm not based in London. Um, so I didn't become a member and then at the time I was living in Manchester and I knew I was going to be moving to Liverpool which was what we had planned and the thing about Liverpool for me is I lived here 30 years ago as a student uh, for three years and at the time I lived here Hillsborough happened it was the first time I ever visited Anfield Oh. Even though I've been a Liverpool fan since I was four. Um, oh. <laughs> and, um, and it was a dream for me to come to Liverpool as a uni you know, to university. Mm. I was a big Beatles fan, big John Lennon fan. And um, I couldn't get over the sense of community that I experienced there. Mm. I'd never seen anything like it, you know, in any city. And I've lived in lots of different cities in my time. But the way the community came together and supported each other, looked after each other, honoured each other. Mm. For me, it just kind of made sense that B collaboration and Liverpool would go hand in hand. And yeah. so I wanted to be involved in B collaboration from what I'd experienced. And I wanted to build something in Liverpool. You know, coming back 30 years later, I don't know anyone here. Right. Um, so it's really from nothing. But it seems perfect to match these two loves together, if you like, and build something. Yeah. So um, that's why. Brilliant. And, and at the end of the day, build something that's actually going to make a huge difference. Because when you pull a few people, a few people, it just starts with a few people and it grows and it grows and it grows. And you, you pull those people together that are also passionate about making a difference and can see where there is a need and they can see who they can help and they can see where their talents can be combined, then all of a sudden yes. you start to get traction. So what a challenge for you then when you say you're walking into a city, I don't know anybody. <laughs> 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 you, you're going to sort of start this from the ground up. Where when Erkan and I started over in uh, Hartford, we both had you know, a database we could call on. We both had a bit of a, a network that we could go to to ask, would you like to come along to a meeting? <clears throat> but you're literally doing it from scratch. Did that daunt yeah. you when you thought about that? You know, it didn't daunt me. Um, I know a few people on the periphery of Liverpool. So I know people, you know, I've got a good friend in Warrington, people in Manchester, people in Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, but I also have a wide network of people around the world you know we lived in uh, in india for four years and a lot of my, my friends that i made in england have since moved back to south africa or australia or mm. etc so it's there's a wide network of people and then suddenly you know as i said earlier i'm a big liverpool fan mm. suddenly there's all these liverpool fans that are coming out of the woodwork that i've never i've known these people for years and i never knew they were a fan yeah. And it's like, well, what's your connection to Liverpool? Oh, I used to live there. And, oh, I grew up there. And wow. suddenly these, these communities 
coming yeah. out of the woodwork um, that I never knew had any association with Liverpool. And of course, I think one of the strongest cities in the country, people are so proud to be Liverpudlian, aren't they? Um, they are. Quite rightly too. They um, are. But it's so lovely to see. It. And probably Manchester as well has got that kind of vibe. But you, And I suppose people visit an international city, London. But I do feel that Londoners and, you know, Tell me I'm wrong, Londoners, but I do feel that a lot of people in London are quite cynical about, you know, oh, well, it's the way it is. Oh, you can't change anything. What can you do? And they kind of get on with their life with their head down. Yeah. They survive it and they get through it. Where I just feel like the people of Liverpool are more likely to roll their sleeves up. I mean, as you say, come together. Well, it's, it's got a really long history, you know, since we've been here. I mean, Richard was born here, but um, he, does, he tends to do a lot of reading in terms of finding out background yeah and um you know he, liverpool was one of the main cities in the world in the days of empire yeah. um you know it's where everything arrived and everything left um it was twinned with new york in yeah. its heyday you know you just look at the architecture here and you can see how cosmopolitan how rich it once was mm. and um you know he recently read a book about the 10 cities that got impacted by the end of empire yeah. and you know you've got mumbai and delhi in there but number 10 is uh, is liverpool yeah you know and it, in its time it has become very poor from going to one of the richest cities in the world to one of the poorest in this country yeah. um, but you would never see it you'd never mm. see it on people's faces i've not encountered any you know, everywhere I go, I do experience some level of racism and I'm yeah. in tune with that because of my background. But I've not experienced that in Liverpool. Wow, ever. that's brilliant. So, you know, I've walked into pubs and thinking, oh my God, it's going to be a bit tense. Nothing, just really warm, welcoming. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, so, it, you know, it's got that history, you know, it's got yeah. a slave museum. I mean, how many cities have yeah. a museum dedicated to its history around slavery? Yeah. And um, it's, it's very cosmopolitan. It's got the oldest Chinese community. It's got one of the oldest black communities. And it celebrates that quite yeah. uniquely, I think. You're going to be in education for us, aren't you? I think I didn't, I didn't know half of those things. It's brilliant. I can't wait to, to get up there. So what's the magic day? When do we launch? We launch on the 17th of May. And um, it's uh, a Friday. Mm -hmm. There's no football on. So oh. it's good. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it's in the heart of the city. It's in a, a place called Hardman Street, which I know quite well, mm -hmm. being... Um, my university student union just used to be around the corner um, and you know what I've forgotten the venue the name of the venue it's something in the fly isn't it the... yeah the, the the is it the fly in the low that's it fly in the low yes. I knew there was a fly in there somewhere um, and it's a it's a beautiful pub you know when I went in there I was going around venues in Liverpool there are some beautiful venues in Liverpool mm. um, but some were not available and we just happened to go past this pub walked in and um he showed us the venue and it seems perfect and one of the things he said is look you know it's a very small community in liverpool everybody knows everybody mm. so it was just a nice feel to it and you know um it's got a beautiful view of the cathedral which oh, wow. again is um it's an anglican cathedral it's the biggest anglican cathedral in the world apparently is it yeah, wow. and it's just stunning. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good place, I think. Mm. It's going to work out. Um, I think the yeah. word will soon spread, won't it? If you say it's a, a close community, it's, um, once, once we've had one or two meetings, then yes. the word will get out. So yeah. tell us a little bit about Sangeeta, where you grew up, what shaped you, what are your views on the world? What's your journey? <sighs> tell us a bit about you. Well, I, um, I was born to immigrants from India. Mm -hmm. So my dad came over in the 50s, my mum in the 60s. And uh, 
so I was a child in the 70s. So, you know, any childhood photos are all flares and orange and tan. Yeah. Uh, so like you won't see any of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got some of those. Thank goodness most of the photos were in black and white in those days. It didn't quite so <laughs> yeah. bad. Yeah. So um, my mum and dad, um, it's quite unusual because my, my dad um, has two brothers and a sister. And my mum has two sisters and three brothers right and my mum's elder sister is married to my dad's elder brother okay right <laughs> so so my grandmothers knew each other and my grandmothers kind of got my mum and my dad together right. um and um it's just been um when they came over we ended up living in a house double fronted victorian house enormous house um mm. with all three families like my dad's wow. two brothers their partner their wives and their children mm. and uh, and my grandmother so it was um literally i think at first it was 12 children and seven adults that's interesting because my parents are very similar um in well for my dad's family he was one of 12 and him and his um, brothers used to live in one house and his mum and dad and all the girls used to live in the other house. <laughs> oh, wow. And they would all go next door for dinner. <laughs> oh, then, wow. Yeah, and then they'd have Wednesday night was like a games night and they would have a, a pool match or a card game or something. Um, and she would do all of their washing and look after them and cook the dinner. And they That's had amazing. Miles chair and Pa's chair by the fire. And they had their little routines. So this must have been... My dad was born in 1925, so early 30s, that, that environment. But it is a case of everyone got together. And yeah. then when they moved out one by one, they would then support the people that were left behind. That's right. Uh, and then they were sort of helped and supported as they got their places as they went on. It's, um, that was community, wasn't it? In those it days. was, yeah. I mean, we used to have people who would arrive from India, stay with us until they got established. You know, people well, like when Uganda happened, all the Indians were asked to leave Uganda, you know, yeah. family from there came over, stayed with us and then got supported until they found their own place. Yeah. So there was always a sense of community. And, um, you know, the other thing my dad did in the 60s is everyone from his village that were, came over from India, they would gather together in that house, wow. in our house, every Easter Sunday. Oh until it got too small and then we found other locations but you know for about 30 years every easter sunday they would meet and they would raise money to build roads libraries get school uniforms oh, wow. for the community back in india yeah, yeah. and as a result of it all the other villages around us started doing having those meetups as well and Fantastic. i think my life living in that house and watching my dad build communities mm. is why I'm so enrolled in the idea of collaboration because yeah. I think I've seen it in action yeah. in so many different ways yeah, I think it's 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 vital have you been over there to see his legacy to see yes his yes we <laughs> when we I graduated the same year as my brother and 1990 and my dad was like in the summer holidays we had all these plans and he was like right we're going to India and none of us wanted to go at all <laughs> we were like we've got plans we've just graduated we've got this freedom we want to play and <laughs> nope, he was like we're going to India <laughs> and uh so we all six of us went to India and it was monsoon and I think mm -hmm. we arrived at midnight and we had all these people come pick us up and we were in these jeeps and cars driving through the streets of Mumbai in pitch darkness oh. and it's raining and there were people sleeping on the streets mm. and it was like you've arrived in hell. Had you been before? That, that I'd been when I was 10. Right. So that's the first yeah. time as an adult where you kind of comprehend. It, yeah. As a child, it's like, you know, running bare feet and not having a toilet. It's no big deal. You know, you're just a kid. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as a 20 something year old, you're like, no, this is not going to work. Mm. And um, when we arrived at my dad's house, there was no toilet. There was no running water. We all slept in one room with three yeah. beds. Oh, wow. And, um, 
we, my sisters and I had just discovered banana conditioner from Body Shop. <laughs> That's funny. What and so that. we had banana <laughs> conditioner and it was like mosquitoes had a field day. Oh, it was no. like, so everything that could go wrong was wrong. You know, there's no fridge. Oh, my mum had packed cornflakes and, you know, things like that. And we would eat cereal and think there's stuff moving in us breakfast bowl and oh, just oh. no, no coca-cola india was closed to um outside business then you know globalization yeah. hadn't happened yeah and so you know we i remember my sister had seen a bottle of coke like a two liter bottle of coke in the market and she was like <gasps> coke <laughs> it was like 20 pounds for a two liter <gasps> bottle of coke and we were wow. like can't afford mm. that so no, it was a um, level of the price where you just won't go above it no matter how <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it was a real cultural shock but you know during that visit there was a school open day like an awards you know end of school yeah and my dad was the guest of honor and you know he presented prizes to the students mm. and we just really got to see what his work had accomplished, you know, his and the community's work back in England had accomplished in that village. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they still meet to this day, not no longer on Easter Sunday, but uh, we still meet every year. And so it's... Uh, Easter Sunday, is it a Christian family? What's, what's the faith? No, it's a Hindu family. It was always on Easter Sunday because no one was working. Oh, right. So everyone knew everyone was on holiday. Yeah. And so yeah. the next day they could recover from, you know, celebration. um, the celebrations. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, that's why it was always on Easter Sunday, but so that, no more. That's an amazing memory for you to take, isn't it? You know, the, <clears throat> the difference between the luxury that you had at that point in the UK, like a, a toilet, <laughs> we, <laughs> we take it for granted, don't we? I mean, I was, when I was a kid up to the age of about eight or nine, um, we had an outside toilet, we didn't have a bathroom, we didn't have um, running hot water, but we had running water and we had a toilet, it was just outside. Yeah. Um, my aunt used to tell me stories about when she was um, a child going to the bottom of the garden to get the water pump and they'd have to smash the ice, uh, the water pump, otherwise they couldn't get the water in and then take yeah. it indoors and like, oh yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> just, it didn't seem that bad. But of course, when you're a kid, as you say, you don't care, do you? You kind of no. get used to it. My mum must have been really tough. No hot water, you know, washing clothes. My dad was a docker. She had to wash all of his clothes every night. He came back drenched with the sweat where he was manual working all the time. Yeah. And now you look at what we have today. Boy, do we take life for granted, don't we? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my, my, my one of the first stories my mum told me about me mm. was when she was about eight months pregnant and I was born in winter. I was born in January, early January. And uh, she said, you know, the, we lived on the, in the middle of a hill. So top of the hill. And um, she said she used to carry the wheelbarrow, drag the wheelbarrow down the hill to get the coal because the coal truck couldn't get up yeah. the hill. Yeah, she was eight months pregnant wow. with me, you yeah. know, and it, and and it was hard. I think, yeah. you know, for her especially, not speaking the <clears> language, <throat> you know, the food, the culture. You know, my mum's never worn anything but a sari in her whole life, and wow. it's like just the image of her dragging that wheelbarrow down, getting the coal, and dragging it back up. Mm. Eight months pregnant in the middle of winter, just <sighs> has me get you know like their life was hard but their life was always about making a difference as well which is i think where i get it from yeah yeah that passion and desire to make a difference there are some things we inherit from our parents that um, sometimes go unnoticed but it is that kind of instinctual thing within you that um it comes out you can't you can't lose that can you when the parents no. have been such an example it's lovely so um what do you do now what's the day job what I do now is I coach. So um, I got into the world of coaching about 26 years ago and have been doing that for organizations or for the last 12 years for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's something that I'm very good at and have skills in. And I really love the idea of just having a conversation with someone that makes a difference yeah um you know impacts their life and has them go through a barrier that they didn't think they could um 
so yeah, but that's what I do. I also work as a trainer, um, a freelance trainer for different organizations, um, including an organization that used to be called Youth at Risk, which is now called Grit, that works with young people. Mm. They used to work with people that, young people that were um, in the, um, the system in terms of crime and um, prisons or, mm. uh, well, I can't remember the word. Um, but anyway, so now they work with still young people, but in universities and schools, colleges, and it's really about empowering them in what's possible. Mm. Um, so I love that given I've spent so many years in education, it's, it's really great. And I love working with young people. Have you, um, in the community, have you come across Beju Solanke? Um, I've heard of him. Oh, you need yes. to catch up with that boy because, um, I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but he has got, um, many connections with schools, but he puts on what he calls an extravaganza. Oh, um, right. Not an event. No, 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 no. Heaven forbid. It's not <laughs> Um, and he gets something like, I don't know, 120 young people in the room because his philosophy is uh, young people go off to college or university and they get a business qualification and then come out with a little piece of paper that says they passed, but they actually have no idea how to be an entrepreneur and potentially run a, biscuit, a, a, biscuit, a business for themselves. So he set up this group, uh, this extravaganza so that young people could come and experience what he learn when he first came out of the corporate world so he's had to spend loads of money going to talks and seminars and, and he learned the hard way of how mm. to be an entrepreneur and what he decided is he was going to bring some of these speakers into his hometown which was south end in order to share with them for free what they needed to know you know about accountancy about social media about branding about websites you know about coaching all these things. And he offered them an opportunity to pitch a business idea and the winner of the pitch would get, um, I think they got an accountant for a year, a coach for a year, a website and a brand for their, and it was all free. And it's, it's like, I don't know, 10,000 pounds worth of value um, for that winner. Um, but he was very clever because he didn't just bring in the people so these kids could sit there and learn. And, oh yeah, okay. He brought in um, rappers, singers, dancers, poets, wow. who were their age. And, wow. and they basically stood on stage, did their thing, audience went wild, but then they said, they had, were interviewed by him, and they said, I've not just got here overnight, I've been working on this since I was five, I've been working on this since I was 12, you know, whatever yeah. it was, it was a long journey to get them to be, I think he had one guy that was um, a finalist on The Voice at some wow. point, everyone was like going mad, because he was, you know, he'd just been on telly last night, and there he was in front <laughs> of the day, you know, um, and the fact that he got all these kids out, um, at like nine o'clock on a Sunday morning and they kind of came in going like, yeah, go on, impress me. And then by six o'clock, it was a long day. By six o'clock that evening, they were walking out on a massive high of, oh my God, I want to run my own business. Yeah. It's phenomenal. So I think probably a lot of the stuff that you do would be really good dovetailing collaboration in, in some of the things that he's done. Now, obviously he's got on Spirit Global, which is his organization, his business now, but um, want to be an entrepreneur, which was the, extravaganza is still in the background is still bubbling under and I think you two would probably have a, a lot in common to see yeah that. I think you know I love working for myself and I think it's uh it's something that people are exploring more and more especially young people mm. and you see young people taking the lead you know Greta Thunberg from Sweden this oh, environmentalist unbelievable you know, it's like i'm learning from her in terms of how i can make a difference around something yeah. like climate change yeah and i think there's a lot of potential in young people that tends to get squashed not intentionally but does tend to get squashed in the mm. sense of you know the the students i work with at universities they want to go to university but they're not fulfilling their passion. Mm. They're studying things like accountancy or law because that's going to give them a job. It's going to pay off their loan, yep. but it's not what they're passionate about. And, you know, I studied something that I was passionate about. I studied psychology because I was passionate about understanding people and what made them tick. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, I think having young people get 
that they can do whatever they want choice and and really fulfill on that and be okay financially you know in terms of their creativity their ingenuity just be okay about it um you know i watched my dad i watched my dad build business after business after business and it wasn't until he was in his i think early 50s that his a business took off oh you know but he never gave up he just he was so creative in his ideas and I think if we can have people get back in touch with that, um, it's, it's a, a kind of resilience, isn't it? That, that you kind of, um, I don't know whether people can find it or it's just in them. It's, it's just this consistent, keep going, keep going, keep going. And eventually the tide will turn. There'll be a tipping point and, and you can then push it onto the next level. And I think if you're not going to search out and experiment, what do I want? What am I passionate about? What do I like? easier to find out what you don't like half the time but I did um, a stress busting club for a six four months years ago it's a six week thing we did and um, most of the kids were so stressed with their A-levels it wasn't true mm. but getting to talk to them and understand you know that it's you're putting this upon yourself and you it's not that it's a piece of paper we're talking about here I said well, so why are you doing this A-level oh because my mum wants me to why, why are you doing this A-level oh well my dad thinks it will help me get a good job so what was yeah. your favorite subject at school? Oh, it wasn't this. Yeah. And they were like, oh, no wonder they were kind of so desperate to do well for other people. Yeah. And whilst it's good to want your mum and dad to be proud of you, I think most parents would want to be proud because their children are doing what they want to do, what they choose to do, and are successful at what they're choosing to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where half the stress in the world comes from because we're all actually just jogging along, not particularly enjoying what we're doing. Oh, completely. I mean, I, I was a straight A student in my first, well, junior school and senior school. Mm. And then when it came to choosing my options, I wanted to do art and geography and history. And wow. my dad was like, no, you're a straight A student. You could be a doctor and you should do oh. biology and physics and chemistry. And I hate, I just oh. didn't like those subjects. <laughs> I love biology, but chemistry and physics were beyond oh. me. Oh, I um, and I ended up failing everything, oh. you know. Um, and now it's like, I don't care what A levels or O levels I got. No, no. You know? it's just, it's life is so beyond that. Um, and I love what I do. I love interacting with people and working with people. Um, you know, if I'd been a doctor, I would have just been with people who are ill and I don't know that I would have enjoyed that at all <laughs> <laughs> have you read that book um this is going to hurt no I can't remember the the guy's name you'll come to me in a minute it's a bestseller it's out there a lot of people have read it um and it's basically a junior doctor and the horror of being a junior doctor uh and then working in the gynecology department and the hours they have to do and the pressure they are under it's like who would choose to do that it's yeah. definitely not for the money you know, um, and it's just so tough and you have to be going so long before all of a sudden you become a consultant and then you can have even more responsibility heaped onto you with slightly more money. It, it yeah. just is bonkers. And unless you really, that's your vocation. Yeah. Why would you go and, and deal with that? It'd be so hard. But, you know, having said that, I've got, t- I know two women who are in their forties who decided to train to be doctors. Yeah, if it's a vocation, exactly. So, yeah, if they yeah, want to do exactly. it, awesome. If, I think so. I think if you want to do it, you will eventually, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, it wasn't for me. Not no, for me. Well I done. was more interested in people's minds than their bodies. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, what, what a cross-reference, though. Art and geography. I just had you down as a traveller and a journalist or something. <laughs> well, you know, I remember doing geography um, before picking my options and reading about the Amazon rainforest. Ah. And then I remember watching a documentary about the Amazon rainforest and there were dolphins swimming. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, I've, I've got to go there. And then when I finished university, a friend of mine canoed down the Amazon river. Wow. And I was oh, like, I've got to do that. So that is on my bucket list. So That's fantastic. <laughs> one day that and the great barrier reef, I would love to visit. Yes, yeah, definitely. The, um, one of the things on our platform, um, one of the questions I ask people is um, what adventure, what's your greatest adventure in life so far? And I was, I was playing it small. What did I say? Um, I can't remember what my, my thing was, but along the lines of um, 
making the bed in the morning you know it's like it was really mundane but it was like an adventure for me to go yes I did it kind of thing <laughs> but the stories that are coming back are like oh my goodness wow. one, one person went you know um free fall parachute jump and somebody else went yeah 20 free fall parachute jumps and like whoa top that and then somebody did and somebody did it's just unbelievable the adventures yes. that people are able to have nowadays it's just phenomenal so I, I love that bucket list go paddle down the Amazon <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to be holding your bag on that one. If that's all right, no, that's I'll, fine. That's you tell fine. me the story when you get back. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> it's a good one. So, if that's what you're good at, you're coaching, uh, and you've obviously been doing that for some time. Um, who are the sort of people that you coach? Who's going to come looking for you? Um, I coach people on so many different things. So, mm. you know, when I was in India. Um, I was coaching people who were from the UK who had businesses out there right. um, and trying to break the Indian market. Right. Uh, in, you know, everything from people who worked in the field of car manufacturing to people who ran a charity out there, um, educating and empowering men, young men. Um, I... Right now, I'm coaching someone who's standing for office um, as a local councillor. Um, I it, it varies. I mean, you know, there are couples that I coach who are looking at having a breakthrough in their relationships. Oh, um, so yeah, and and but I think the probably the biggest category are other coaches. I mm. I believe in practicing what you preach. So having a coach, if I'm yeah. coaching, then having a coach. And what I say to a lot of people who are going into the world of coaching is, do you have a coach? Mm. Um, so, you know, I just spoke to a potential client yesterday who has been in the world of coaching. She's quite young in that field uh, for the last two years and is now struggling. And she's got all these plans of having a family and, you know, uh, building her life and then finding that she hasn't got room for all of it because she's coaching all these people and there's no one to support her. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm taking her on as a, as a coach, as a coach for her. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> I think most coaches that I've come across, are, are kind of insatiable learners as well, aren't they? They're always constantly, what else can I grab onto? And I know I'm, you know, I'm a voracious reader, but also I love being on, um, online courses or, or whatever so it's like wherever you can support yourself is is find someone as you say someone you can turn to when you're like why isn't this working What's yeah it's on? one of, it's one of the gripes I think I have about the world today you know whether you're an entrepreneur whether you're a coach whether you're starting university um whether you're is starting a new relationship it's like you're supposed to have all the answers yeah you're yeah. supposed to know everything and just work it out and that's not the case you know um why be collaboration for me is we don't have all the answers yeah. we can't possibly know everything there is to know in the world and mm. if we can ask for support or work together to work a problem out then i think there'd be less stress less you know, um, competition, there'd be more solutions than problems. And I know it sounds quite idealistic. I've been accused of being quite idealistic, but I, I, I think I'd prefer to be than uh, yes. cynical. Yeah, cynical. Uh, um, so, you know, I think um, coaching, when people say, oh, I don't know whether I need a coach, I think everybody does. Everybody does. Like everybody needs a doctor or everybody needs an accountant. I think everybody needs a coach because you can't see yourself in your bubble no. about how you're interacting with life or how your patterns are repeating themselves in, you know, different situations. Um, and like you say, I'm still discovering so much oh. about myself Mm. Uh, through my coaches about where I'm limiting myself or you know re repeating old patterns of behavior that don't work for me at 52 even though they may have worked for me in my 20s yeah um, and it's just knowing that and being able to work with someone and trust someone to be able to show you that mm. so that you can break through and yeah 
have new skills and new abilities and new patterns that serve you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, it's a, d- a difficult thing to acknowledge sometimes with, to kind of go, okay, I'm, I'm stuck. And I think in this country, maybe, is this a generalization? Probably. Um, we're not very good at asking for help. We kind of have this stiff upper lip of, you know, oh, I can get on with that, put my head down and I'll, I'll work through it and I'll come out yeah. there. And, um, it's not in just in this country. I think it's, no. you know, like in India, it would be the same. Yeah. You're supposed to know how to be an entrepreneur. You know, you're supposed to know how to have your marriage work. Um, and again, you know, the communities that you had in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s are not there as much no. anymore. No. And so where you would get support, you, you don't anymore. You know, just going through menopause it's like well where are all the women in my age that I should be asking <laughs> yeah. it's like, you know what you go online it's Facebook. <laughs> exactly it's like google it's you know yeah. but it's not the same you know just talking to my friends about what they're going through mm. makes more of a difference to me than reading it online yes and what um, they found that has worked for them and yeah where to exactly. get it and all those kind yeah. of things. you're right it is is that's kind of support network um and, you know, we get embarrassed about talking about things. Oh, you know, I'm not supposed to let anyone know if, you know, my marriage isn't working or if my business isn't working or, mm. you know, if my health isn't working. But, I mean, it makes sense. This is the classic in, um, in business, isn't it? Because obviously as a business coach, I have a lot of people that you, you go networking and you start chatting to people and they go, how's business? You know, they, and everyone goes, fine, it's fine, it's fine. And I think, I know damn well it's not. Yes. Because somebody over there told me that this has happened and that's happened and that's happened. So you know they're kind of just about keeping their head above water. But everyone puts this bravado face on. And actually, that's what I like about B Collaboration is that people can come in and go, oh, I'm having a bad day. This is oh, phew, yeah. this has gone wrong, and and you're allowed to be authentic and and just be vulnerable. Yeah, and I think that's the key word. It's like being authentic, you know, like showing your warts and all, and then being able to do something about it. Because if we're not authentic, we can't do anything about it. We can't ask for help. We can't say I'm struggling with this or I don't know about that, and then we wonder why people don't succeed in what they're passionate about yeah and I'm, I'm all for people saying i'm struggling um but then they need to be able to do something about it as well so yeah. you go ask for help go and and get some support go and then pull yourself with support out of the situation rather than just enjoy yourself going mm, i'm really suffering oh this is terrible i'm yeah. gonna look wound again and again and again and I'm yes going around and around, around in circles i'm like oh come on you know it's I'm, i've been a kind of phrase um ing are you suffering from ing internal navel gazing uh, there, are, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people out there that are just hooked on going on another course another course another course so they can sit there and just look at themselves i'm just working on myself at the moment i'm just making sure you know i've been looking into deep into my spy into my psyche and, and i've got to understand who i am and who i'm being well yes but when you learn a little bit, take a step, learn a bit and then take a step. Don't wallow yeah. in that environment where you feel like you can sit and meditate for three days. And no, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> you know, I love the idea of meditation. I love the idea of yoga. I love the idea of working on yourself, but don't do it to the exclusion of everything else. Don't do it. Absolutely. I mean, I've been in that world of doing course after course after course. Mm. And you know, what I say to people is if you can't, apply it in life then don't go do the next course you know exactly. apply it in exactly. life and create happens, something yeah if, they, if they've done a course for two three days they have to apply it the next day don't just have a little lovely notebook and then never look at your notes later yeah. open it up and go right what am i going to do what oh, i've action? got shelves of notebooks from courses and i don't know that i've ever looked at them again no you know. no but i need to write it down i'm gonna write it down so I'll look <laughs> yeah. at one day. i really will look at this one day when i'm about 80 maybe and then i'll go oh i was gonna do that wasn't i but that's why we have the journal be collaboration 
Uh, yeah. and some people use it really effectively and some people don't even pick it up. But every member has a journal. And in there, that is your place for, oh, that's a really good point. I hadn't looked at it like that before. Oh, I'm going to write that down. So they write it down. But then at the end of the meeting, we go, okay, what have you written down? Now, what are you going to do? And now you know what you're going to do. Who's going to keep you accountable? So that there's somebody sitting next and they go, would you keep me accountable for this? Because I've really got to do this. Yeah, sure. I'll give mm-hmm. you a call in the week. It's little things like that that keep moving it forward, moving it forward. Yeah forward well that's what coaching is just having people be accountable yeah and being on yeah. in your team being on your side being yeah. your cheerleader yeah being yeah. for you and i what one of the things i love doing is when i've got a prospect as you say is sitting down with them trialing them with a bit of coaching to see where they're at and then for me if they're not passionate about what they're doing i can't be passionate about helping them so i kind of need to know that i can see they're all excited and i can see this potential and it's like then I know I want to work with them. And then mm. it's like, yeah, come on, what are we going to do together? And that's why. We, yeah. So I've had one a chap, this is a, a famous story um, where he was, um, did exhibitions and he wanted me to support him. And I said, what are the exhibitions about? He said, oh, it's really easy. He said, all I want you to do is show me how to beat my competition. I said, who's your competition? He says, one other guy in the country. I went, okay, it's one person to beat. Let's do that. I said, what, what's your, uh, ex- what do you exhibit? He said, oh, not much. He said, it's usually for the MOD. It's, it's like tanks and guns and grenades and things. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> Thank you very much for the offer. But I can't do that. I, I, no. I cannot enthuse and be passionate about something that's going to go and kill people. It yeah. Makes no sense. So I think you're probably the same. Is Once you get somebody in front of you that you go, whoa, we can do a lot here. We can really help each other. Because you want to see the actions. And they are not going to make the actions if they're, doing ing yeah or the internal navel gazing yeah so sangeeta what makes you angry what really <laughs> gets you going uh too many things i would imagine um actually i don't know that i'm as angry as i once was what used to make me angry was racism mm. uh sexism all the isms basically yeah um but now I think I, I'm more tolerant. I don't know if it, that's the right word even. Mm. But I'm, I'm learning that actually what's going to make the difference in those situations is not anger, is talking, is discussion, is you know, being able to listen to a person's point of view and see what's on the other side. You know, I was just watching, I just watched like 10 minutes of that documentary about the school exchange that's happening right. in the Midlands. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a, a Muslim school and a very white middle class school. And then they have this exchange of students. And, um, you know, I remember being at school and being bussed out and going with all the other black children at the time. Um, and there was no explanation. There was no conversation. There was no addressing yeah. it. And in wow. this documentary yesterday, the teachers are trying to open up the conversation of, you know, why does that happen? And what's that like for you? And, you know, all the kids from the white school are like, you know, I can't believe our school's doing this. Mm. And it's when people, again, you know, it's the word collaboration. When people are working together, they're able to see a human being as a human being and not as a Muslim or as a, you know, black person or as a gay person. It's just a human being. And then Mm. I fundamentally do believe that human beings are good. You know, there is compassion and empathy and love for your fellow human being. Mm. And sometimes our experience, our uh, life, our education, our, you know, alters the way we see that person and stop seeing them as human beings as yeah. people yeah and that's fundamentally it you know i you know brexit is a big conversation that living in manchester 23rd of june you know 24th of june there was a lot of that kind of experience in manchester for me mm. um and it was like going back in time that was my experience of living in the uk in the 70s certainly not as an adult and then to think oh my god nothing's changed how can nothing have changed yeah and it's not that nothing's changed (coughs) 
I think the conversation has been suppressed. And I'm mm. responsible for that as much as anyone, you know, that you can't talk about racism or, you know, if you, someone says anything, then you just label them as a racist as opposed to saying, wow, where did that point of view come yeah. from? You know, yeah. where, why do you think that? And just really relating to each other as people and going beyond that so that it works for everyone. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I was angry about that. I'm not as angry about that. I'm more open to having a conversation. Do you, um, do you think that the way the world is going at the moment where we are um, moving away from family, you know, somebody's in Australia, somebody's in the UK, uh, we're moving away from the people we grew up with, in, you know, everyone's far flung. Community as we used to have it, in my childhood at least, where you knew everybody up the street and you could walk to school because you knew people along the way that would look out for you at the age of six. I used to walk to school on my own. Mm. Um, that community isn't, doesn't really exist anymore. So do you think people cling to groups of what they think are, um, like, you know, the football community, the, um, a Facebook group community, um, a gang of people on the estate, as a community do you think they're trying to find some way of belonging i i imagine i imagine so mm. um you know i and that's why they don't want to give up this um yeah this the ideals of the community that they're in so if the community they end up kind of growing into from the age of 13 or 14 but maybe are into carrying knives you know, well, that's what we all do. So I'm going to stick with that because otherwise I'm out on my own and I'm not part. I think, I think there are elements of that. But I also think that, um, you know, the, the world, it's a funny place, the world at the moment. I used to think, you know, I wish I was born in the 30s and then I would have been an adult in the 60s with free love and peace and You'd all of that. You'd have to go through a world war then. Or, or <laughs> you know, if I was born like 100 years from now and I'd be travelling to Mars or whatever yeah. sci-fi kind of world. But I think, you know, the world, there seems to be so much wrong with the world. But I also think there's a flip side of so much great things happening. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine reminded me of this because I was like, you know, all this and Hillsborough has been 30 years and no resolution. And he was like, there's so many great things happening. You know, um, you just got to look at Extinction Rebellion in London at the moment or, mm -hmm. you know, look at a lot of the things that are happening to impact climate change. You know, I'm, this week alone, it's like Australia, New Zealand, India, um, Colombia are planting a million trees to impact the environment you know and you don't hear about that you just hear about oh you know these rebels are stopping traffic in marble arch it's like yeah no, there's so many good things happening because that's all they and, report isn't it on the mainstream media that's generally all you're going to get and you forget it is 90 percent of the people out there are amazing they are and there's lots of people who are up to something you know i remember reading this facebook thing of like if you put you know, the top thousand scientists in a room together for three days, what would they come up with? Um, they would come up with solving everything, I imagine, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think, you know, with the, the issues around crime and, you know, I mean, Liverpool is one of the highest rates of crime, um, you know, shootings, etc. But I think that there is... Um, there's a lot that can be done if society was willing to work in a collaborative, in a supportive, in an empowering way. Mm. There is a lot of, you know, in the world of austerity, a lot of money that has been depleted out of community yeah. projects or social projects that I think if the government won't, communities need to. Mm -hmm. bring those projects back yeah. yeah there's a beautiful um building in the park across the road from our house it used to be a, um a mental asylum in the 1920s i think and it's just a beautiful building that is just derelict now mm. and i keep every time i walk past it i keep imagining what it would be like if that was a youth center 
where there were recording rooms and you know play oh. rooms and little places where you could do art or play football or you know go and get coaching about your new innovative idea for business or you know like what would what would it take to have that happen yeah um, and I think there's a lot to be done and it's not about money you know every time I watch a red nose day I see the UK no. raise millions. millions of pounds and it's not like you couldn't do that in your community you know and and have something accessible to people whether it's the elderly whether it's the young people whether it's people starting their own businesses to support them in having something magical happen and I think half the time it kind of gets, it's a bit like um, there was a discussion the other day on, on where does all the money go and have we got enough money for education and should we put money into this and put money into that. Um, when you go into the council and you say there's this disused building, what can we do? Oh, I haven't got the budget, I haven't got the finance, you know, we can't do this, we can't do that. But if you took away the right and wrong of life, it's, you know, well, let's go, there's one big pot of money, I'm sure somebody somewhere, oh, it, it was some, a discussion around... Um, the House of Lords have asked uh, for pensioners to give up their bus passes and um, TV licences in order to allocate it to the younger generation so that they can be supported with um, apprenticeship schemes and learning schemes. Um, and there's d various different schools have thought about it, but it was like, you know, why don't they start from the beginning? Because, you know, if, we, if we're taking from the elderly to give to the young, well, why are we spending so much money? I mean, somebody used an example that there's so many million pounds being sent over to India, as an example, and yet they've got their own um, space program. Well, maybe if they didn't put their money in a space program, we wouldn't have to send so much, so we wouldn't have to take the money off the OAPs. But that's not why they send money to India. No, no, I know there's a lot, <laughs> what, I'm saying, what, what the, the conversation around it was, forget those kind of details. We have a pot of money. And I think it's been the bureaucracy is the devil in the detail. Well, the, it's, it's, see, I always get a bit, that argument about sending money abroad is always coming up in question time or whatever. Mm. There, there is a backstory to why money is sent to places like Africa or India, course, which is yeah. that there is an exchange yes. happening in the background you know, they get their oil cheaper, they get their uh, waste processed or whatever it is, whatever deal they've got going on, I imagine. Yeah. Um, the, the issue for me is, you know, it's like you, the, the MPs have just had a pay rise. Um, you know, they've got su um, subsidised food and drink in the Houses mm. of Parliament. Mm. They've just spent billions of pounds renovating the Houses of Parliament, which I understand. You know, the... the they're spending millions of pounds. This is one of the things that gets me angry is they're spending millions of pounds, all these local councils chopping down trees and putting netting over trees yeah. to stop the birds. So that if the birds aren't mating or nesting there, then they can get rid of, it get rid of the trees yeah. and build. It's like, come on, you know, there is money. There was a time when, you know, as a student, the government paid for my degree. Mm. We're not doing that anymore. Where's that money gone? Yeah. But this is the, the you know, point I'm making about bureaucracy is that if we sort of started from scratch and goes, okay, we've got this many people in the, in the UK, this is how much tax they're paying. These are all, these are the roads that we've got. These are, I'm sure it's misallocated. And because, it is misallocated. You know, there was a time we were paying poll tax and now we pay poll tax. Where does that money go? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, it was a time when the bins were collected and the roads were swept and the, you know it was world transformation day a couple of weeks ago for me what i did is i just went and picked up the litter from my street because there's no road sweepers oh, wow. it's like i don't want chris packets and whatever yeah. on my street so no one's going to do it i'm going to do it yeah and it's like you know what if we just did that my mum always used to say why do people do sponsored walks or sponsored you know um table tennis or something she says why don't they do sponsored litter picks go and Absolutely. do it useful don't be sponsored for doing uh, dancing for 24 hours what's that all about go and do something that's going to actually make an impact yeah and it. It, you know and i think that is possible if communities came together and, and it goes back to what's keeping us divided what's keeping us in our own little bubbles and yeah. saying you know um 
there's no sense of going next door and borrowing a bowl of sugar anymore. You know, there's, you know, someone, a friend of mine posted this thing from the Guardian today about, you know, there's libraries where you can borrow books. What if there was a library where you oh, could borrow them. lawnmowers and drills? And, yes. and I had this idea of like 10 years ago. It's like in one street, you don't need 50 lawnmowers. What no. if there was just two lawnmowers and you yep. could just use it when you wanted to? But when you had a drill, how many times you use it? Probably every other Exactly. Second. You know, we've just moved house and it's like, there's all these things and it's like, I've got nowhere to put them. There is a place Don't that does it them. now. There's a, a group called the People Who Share. Right. Uh, and they have Global Sharing Week in June. Uh, and yeah. we partner up with them as B Collaboration. We have partnered up with them. So we go have a B Collaboration meeting and at the meeting, we swap all of our skill sets. We put them all down, uh, what we need on little post-its and then what we can offer. And then we marry people up so they then get free something. Uh, and they're sharing their, their skill sets. But um, Benita Matoska has spoken, um, I think on the United Nations, about exactly that. Mm. So there's all these little people that are popping up in different places that I've got exactly the same idea. Uh, and it's a bit like you can uh, share my car now, can't you? There's an app where if you're yes. going to Scotland, you can go on there and see if anybody else is going up to Scotland and you can yeah. grab a lift yeah. them and save half the expense. Or, yeah. Uh, you know, I have a garage that's not being used. You, um, if you live near the station, you can rent out your, your drive so pump, people can park on it, that kind of thing. And that's the way forward. And I think at some point we'll do away with cash because we'll be doing the exchange. Have you come across um, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu movement? No. Um, there's a guy over in South Africa whose name escapes me, but if you just Google the Ubuntu movement, you'll see it. Um, and he is very much believing that we should do away with money and we can exchange our goods and services. And he was looking desperately for somewhere to trial it. And about six months ago, I think, or maybe longer, um, there was a town in Canada. They've gone, yep, we'll do that. Um, and then the mayor comes on Facebook and does a Facebook Live once a week to say how it's going. Wow. Um, last time I heard, about three months ago, it was doing really, really well. So it's a bit like the Bristol Pound, you know, where um, within a certain area, this is the scheme they use. But yeah. bit by bit by bit, the people that live there don't use cash within this environment because they don't need it. Yeah. It's clever. Very, very clever. I think, it's, I think it is the way forward. Um, and not need the bureaucracy of the local government. Yeah, yeah. Or even central government. Um, yeah. Because I think government as such seems to have run its day because it's it's getting too clunky and it doesn't seem to work and i think bureaucracy has just choked it totally choked I, I think you know you just gotta look at the whole i mean the extinction rebellion just the whole environmental mm. movement mm. you know i remember 30 years ago that was a big thing that was mm. emerging and it just disappeared there were a few projects that were happening you know like in terms of our cars or, um, you know, not leaving the tap on when you're brushing your teeth. There's little projects yeah. like that. Yes. But it hasn't impacted the way we needed it to impact because yeah. nothing really has changed. You know, the cars are still there. They're not electric. You know, there's... It, it's like what... What's going to make the biggest impact is community on a local level you know they even say like farming on a local level is yep. what's going to impact the way food is produced in the world yeah and that is the way forward and i think this whole idea of globalization and you know you're having your market accessible to the whole world is has not worked it may have worked for the few but in terms of the planet and in terms of you know, everything living on the planet, it hasn't worked, no. I don't think. No. And, and I think the way forward is a smaller scale community-based project, whether it's food, whether it's environment, whether it's community, whether it's education, mm. is the way forward. Um, I and, agree. And, no. that's, and that's how B Collaboration can be a small part of that by illustrating to people on a monthly basis, you plug into this space, and you understand the concept and the context of collaboration and how to make it work. Yeah, there's a, there's a, an, a friend of mine posted, um, he just did a TED Talk recently and written a book 
and uh, he was talking about, you know, in 20, 2050, mm. what would the education system be like? And he said it would be about teaching children the four C's, which is community, communication, collaboration, and I can't remember what the fourth one was. I like those. Yeah, right up um, my street. Yeah. <laughs> As an ex-teacher, I, I, I totally concur with that. That's brilliant. Like those are the skills people, you know, children yeah. are going to need. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that is the way forward. Well, when you hear stories about children starting school and they can barely keep their head up because they're so used to looking down at a tablet or a phone. Yeah. And they're, they're having to look up at the teacher and it's kind of their necks are aching. And they don't know how to use a knife and fork because they haven't been taught because they're sitting eating in front of a machine. Yeah. Um, it's just so sad. So sad. Oh, we can't end on a sad note. No. <laughs> um, but it's lovely to hear that we're on the same page about what, what kind of riles you and um, it's very similar outlook. Um, tell us about the quest. You've just written an article for our online publication. <laughs> you? I, I have. And that's, um, I haven't written anything like that since I was at university. So that was quite a revelation for myself. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I wrote about collaboration and what it means to me personally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the, during the course of this um, podcast, I've talked about how I feel about race and how I feel about growing up in this country, etc. And, you know, everything my parents had taught me about collaboration and community. And uh, I've always been interested i think since i did my masters and i looked at the whole world of racism and feminism and the combination of the two mm. um as a woman of color mm. is the idea of you know we've tried segregation we've tried integration we've tried um you know the whole world of multiculturalism and all of that it's like what is really going to work in terms of taking everybody forward together is collaboration, you know, mm -hmm. is the idea of everyone being included in the conversation, in the journey and moving forward. It's like the whole thing I said about race, you know, it's like I used to be angry about people who said whatever they said or called me, but now it's like, well, why why do you think that you know the idea of including their narrative um and understanding their perspective mm. as is going to have me move forward as well as them move forward and uh, and that's really what i was writing about is the idea of inclusion and how that is a collaborative process mm. that in, is involves everybody I think that any other form has not worked, you know. I think that's important to remember that it's an ongoing process. You know, collaboration, a lot of people, it's a buzzword at the moment. And a lot, a lot of corporate organisations are like, yes, we collaborate or we, we have to collaborate. Um, and it doesn't just mean putting a group of people together and off you go, go and work on a project together and play exactly. nicely. Exactly. Yeah. It's, you know, there's people think that, you know, if you're in partnership, then that's collaborative. But a mm. partnership may not involve, you know, equality you know you can say in, in an organization there's collaboration between management and workers or whatever it isn't because that's not necessarily the best of everybody in that process you know it's not the benefit of everybody necessarily and the whole um, benefit is is the ultimate win-win-win isn't it for the people that are collaborating but also for the people that they're responding to and the planet as well so it's, yes you've got to be it's, yeah globally. it's got to, it's got to be a win you know, in this day and age, it's got to be a win. It can't just be a, a win for human beings. It's got to be a win for the whole environment, the whole community. Yeah. We've done enough damage, I think, haven't we? And now yeah. To, and in, in any small way that you can, I think people went through a phase of going, oh, what's the point? Because industry is doing this. And so what's the point if I turn my tap on or off? It doesn't matter. But actually, we all collectively working together have a huge impact and we can do it, but we have to work together and collaborate together in order to have that bigger impact. Ab absolutely. And you know, what's happening, it's like, you know, the, what's 
we may leave our taps on because we've got taps in the UK, but you know, the impact is over there in Mozambique at the moment or in the, you know, the, the earthquake in the Philippines, or mm. it's not necessarily on our doorstep. And, uh, and it is about, unless we are willing to see that what we do here is impacting across the globe, exactly. there's, there's, there's no reason for anyone here to change their behavior. No. And it's, you know, and that again is about saying, you know, well, I matter as much as the person in Mozambique. Mm. And, um, and until we change that mindset the idea of people putting their taps off or you know not buying a plastic bag or you know buying their produce locally is not going to change is not going to yeah. transform and that's what we say collaboration our, our definition is humanity at its best and yeah. when humanity is working for the whole and not just the individual yeah with collaboration working yeah best. yeah i mean that that is it yeah Brilliant. Okay. You said that it was going to be such a, an hour is going to be too long. To talk. <laughs> we've, we've gone over an hour. I can't believe <laughs> so, that. I know. Um, to sum up, uh, tell us again the dates and details about the Liverpool group. So it's the Fly in the Loaf on Hardman Street on the 17th of May, uh, between three and six o'clock. And then there'll be drinks afterwards. And it's in Liverpool. And it's the first. Uh, the collaboration meeting outside of the Watford Gap, pretty much. <laughs> it is, yeah, um, and uh, it's going to be a great event. And, you know, I can't imagine a better city to have the first B collaboration outside of the South. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, how do people get in touch? What's the they can get in touch uh, on the website um, or on the Journey of Possibility Facebook page. Or they can contact me. Um, my email address is espatel.business at gmail.com. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to have conversations. You know, if there's people who may not be able to make it because they're not in Liverpool, but they know people in Liverpool, I'm happy to have conversations with them, speak to them, um, and support anybody who is thinking of inviting anyone to okay. see how they can have those people here. And if they can't make the first meeting, are we looking at doing it on the third Friday of the month? Is that right? Uh, at the moment, we're looking at the third Friday of every month. Um, I think it will depend on what other people, what's yeah. going to suit other people who are based in Liverpool. So, yeah, yeah okay. there is that. In there. Yeah. So it yeah. just leaves me to say um, to our audience, don't forget, there are other groups apart from Liverpool. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to come to the London group, um, that's um, 26th of May, uh, 2019, or we've got the Hartford meeting, or we have the Surrey meeting. Um, we're also getting excited that in September, we'll be launching another meeting over in West London at Park Royal. Uh, we've also got the Facebook group, as Sangeeta said, the Journey of Possibility by B Collaboration. Um, please pop over there uh, and ask to join and we'll let you in. Or there is the Mighty Network platform um, known as Collaboration by B Collaboration Global. Um, and there you will meet people from across the world with amazing networks of their own who are all contributing and connecting and providing wonderful shares and videos and lots of learning on there as well so and then you get all the details of the meetings on there too uh, if you're not sure just go to bcollaboration.com all the details of the meetings are on there and we'll be having another podcast shortly but for now sangeeta thank you so much what a fascinating hour i really appreciated that um, and look forward to catching up with you in liverpool next month great thanks Cheers. jill take care bye